day on campus, an exciting day with the weather, and I'm pleased to see you here tonight. I'm Barb Trish, director of the Rosenfield program, um, and you're here to, to listen to a panel on agricultural sustainability in Iowa. This is a both sides now event. This is a, a you know, sort of a, a format that we're working with at Rosenfield and PPPV. PPPE, which is the Program in Practical Political Education, bringing together people with different perspectives or possibly different perspectives on the same issue. And so I'm very grateful for our panelists tonight and our, our facilitator, who I'll just briefly introduce in a moment. Um, but I'm, I'm especially grateful because I think they've probably all had these conversations before, probably some of them with each other. And so it's very nice of them to let us in on it. And so I'm looking forward to listening to what they have to say. Um, your brochure gives you brief biographical information about, about the speakers. I should note that on the brochure, I've, I, it's my mistake, I left the Center for Prairie Studies off as a co-sponsor. So I want to give a shout out to them for making this, um, this event happen, helping make event this happen helping make this event happen. Um, so you're not here to listen to me. I'll just briefly point out our, our guests, and then I'll turn the, um, turn the mic over, so to speak, to, to Brandy. Our facilitator tonight on your right is Brandy Jansen, uh, an alumna of Grinnell, class of 19, 1997. And to her left are Mark Kennett, who many of you know, um, he's a local farmer, Roger Wolf with the Iowa Soybean Association, and Bill Stowe, uh, another alumnus of the college. And so please join me in welcome, welcoming the four of them and thanking them for their participation. Great, well, yes, thank you for coming out on this rather lovely Iowa day that we're having. It's great to be in the uh, former space that's formerly known as Darby Auditorium for some of us. Um, and I'm pleased to, to help facilitate this conversation or get out of the way, whichever seems to make the most sense. Uh, I'm uh, currently a faculty at the University of Iowa in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health, uh, where I deal with a variety of issues related to agriculture, uh, but specifically uh, agricultural safety and health. So I, I, I engage a lot with occupational safety related to agricultural issues, and there are a lot of them, but what, what, I ever, what I learn every time I hear about a problem and I say, can't we just, and then I learn about how much more complicated it is than I initially thought, and I hope that some of that complexity comes into this conversation. So I'll first ask all of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, and then I have a few questions uh, to sort of get the conversation started, and then I think we will turn it over to you all as well, because I hope that you have some comments and, and questions as well for our panelists. So, let's start, Mark. Um, my name is Mark Kennett. I live locally and farm just a little bit and have a small consulting business where I help other farmers um, with crop insurance, um, uh, FSA compliance, and also with their budgeting and financial process. Um, I've lived here and farmed here, just had my 21st crop this past year, and in that time, um, I've doubled my yield. Good evening, I'm Roger Wolf, uh, Director of Environmental Programs and Services at the Iowa Soybean Association. And, um, if you don't know about Iowa Soybean Association, we're the largest state-based row crop commodity association in the U.S. Um, Iowa farmers uh, annually plant about 10 million acres of soybeans, rotated with our friends' uh, corn, <laughs> Iowa corn growers. Um, and um, uh, we like to say that our customers are pigs. Um, <laughs> And I'm sorry, not to, I'm not trying to be funny, <laughs> but um, maybe it was the peace tree. Uh, exactly. uh, yeah, so I, I've really enjoyed being in your, in your city here today. Um, so I, I uh, 
the Iowa Soybean Association, I work uh, for and on behalf of 22 farmer um, leaders. Those are the board of directors and we represent roughly 40,000 soybean producers that grow 500 million bushels of soybeans. Um, those soybeans do feed hogs, but they also are exported to uh, China. China is our biggest customer. Uh, so soybean production, Iowa agriculture is global. Um, we do a lot of things at the Soybean Association. I invite you uh, to our headquarters anytime. Uh, it's in Ankeny. It's just uh, near the D north of the DMAC campus. Would love to show you the office there. Um, my program is environmental programs and services. I have a staff of uh, 11, including myself. Um, they're the ones that actually do the work. Um, but uh, they're very passionate. Uh, they, they wear their values on their sleeves. And it's about improving um, conservation uh, and natural resources and environmental quality. It's part of that. And hopefully we can talk about what that all means in terms of transcending um, environmental quality means downstream water quality, and I'm sure we'll get into that today. And I, and I hope we do talk about sustainability. I, I know, in fact, I know we will talk about sustainability. Um, we, I like to say that sustainability isn't a box that's separate. It's, it's everything we do in terms of being more productive. Congratulations on, you said doubling your yield? Being more productive, being more efficient, taking care of our natural resources, making sure we're part of the community. So that's where the environmental quality comes in. And, and, and the economics have to make sense. We have to, it's all about the livelihood of, of uh, the people in the system, but the system has to work and it's all interconnected. So looking forward to the conversation. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Stowe. I have the pleasure of working for an organization called Des Moines Waterworks. We're a municipal public utility. We have about 500,000 customers in Polk County, Dallas County, Madison County, and Warren County, if you know the central Iowa area. Um, I think tonight you're going to hear kind of a dysutopic uh, diatribe from me. I'll put you on edge right now um, <laughs> that I'm not here to talk about cute pigs and beautiful corn and beautiful soybeans. I'm here to talk about the environmental consequences for uh, a monocrop system and a system uh, where we have gone past our carrying capacity in how we treat and house livestock in our state. Um, I am responsible and the people I work with are responsible for providing a public health commodity. This isn't um, red velvet cupcakes. It's not uh, Iowa Hawkeyes sweatshirts. It's not something you can do without. You, can't go, you can go on a gluten-free diet, you can go on a sugar-free diet, you can't go on a water-free diet, even if you go to Peachtree for all your uh, <laughs> stuff to drink. So, when we talk about sustainability, which is a little bit of an overused term in my view, um, and agriculture, the two not going together very well in my view for most of Iowa, you're gonna hear from me as somebody who has responsibility for a public health commodity, very much impacted by land use in this state, and land use in this state is overwhelmingly industrial agriculture. It's not forests, it's not recreational waters, it's industrial agriculture. You're going to hear that it is anything but sustainable uh, under the current model and under the current conditions here in Iowa. So it's great to be back uh, here at Grinnell. My thanks to Grinnell College uh, and the Rosenfield series for having me and, and uh, my peers here to talk with you in this beautiful place that still is Darby Jim revived. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, that's, sustainability is an overused term. I would not disagree with that. When you look at every billboard or you know piece of furniture now that you buy, it's all sustainable. So let's. Uh, it's a good place to start, and I'd like to hear from each of you on 
sustainability, maybe it's a different term. What are the components? What's the definition? How, would, how should we be, um, if we could come together on, on what this term means, what might that be? Um, and I'd like to hear all of your perspectives on that. And I'm gonna make Mark go first again. Um, at this moment in time, nothing we touch is sustainable. The reasoning for that in my mind is that the economics of row crop production that we're predominantly talking about are negative. So we relatively have been that way for five years. Uh, so we started in 2012 with a big drought. We did receive crop insurance checks for that. Um, that made us think at that moment in time that we were okay. It got us through to the next year, but in general, so that we didn't pay taxes, we bought machinery. But we bought it with pre-tax dollars, and then we had to pay for it with after-tax dollars. 2013, we had the Duracade incident with Syngenta um, supplying to the market a, um, a corn that did not meet phytosanitary uh, standards going into China. We went from five or six dollar corn to three dollar corn in 90 days. Um, the lawsuit is mostly done. No money has been dispensed as a result of that. We're five years later, we're producing below the cost of production. Um, it's not working on the majority of acres. For farmers that are over 70, um, 40 or 50 years of um, revenue generation and capture, they're okay. Farmers under 40 are underwater by a long way. It will take an elder generation to keep them going. Um, the banks are under stress um, on those loans and they're about to do something about it. Uh, we will know that 1st of March, what it looks like. Um, so at this moment, there's no conversation in my mind about sustainability. What we can talk about is regenerative farming where we're trying to um, manage our impact on the soil. Um, as evidenced by the amount of um, cover crop and other such things were below 5%, actual cover crops is 2.6% or something of the acres, row crop acres in Iowa. So on a statistical basis, that's pretty close to zero. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a follow up and how does regenerative agriculture contribute to improving the economic sustainability that you talked about initially? Um, so if we manage our inputs and what we're doing, um, then we have a chance at being more sustainable even in a um, unprofitable circumstance. So that's okay in some circumstances, but given the other circumstances that we've found ourselves in, um, healthcare expenses that have changed dramatically in the last few years, um, the, the net sum doesn't change. So buying less equipment, doing less tillage, um, managing our chemical purchases, blah, blah, blah. With cover crops, we can manage all of that. Um, it will help. It won't s absolutely solve the water quality issues, but we can have a self-interest um, in managing those things. The more money that we spend off farm, the higher the injury is at this moment in time. A and at the same time, what we do, we're not producing food, we produce ingredients when we do row crop, mm -hmm. typical row crop, corn and beans. Mm -hmm. So um, we lack 
um, economic diversity across the landscape. We're all doing the same thing at the same time. Cargill and ADM know it. Yeah, so, um, so I've already alluded to uh, my frustration with a box called sustainability. And <clears throat> I think it's unfortunate um, that um, it's become a marketing term. And um, so, uh, and, and, it, and it's, it's fairly complex. It's, uh, you know, Mark's talking about uh, regenerat regenerative and having economic, um, a portfolio of economic opportunities. There are people that are out on the landscape and there's less of them today than there used to be. Um, and so this, it's, it's complicated. Uh, I think a lot of people want to make it simple. Um, it's, uh, quite frankly, I think um, a lot of it is, is that uh, uh, to be more sustainable, we need a, an era where we are supporting each other. We need cities supporting agriculture. We need agriculture supporting cities. I mean, I would love to, to have an era where my agriculture system is the solution provider to the city of Des Moines. That would help tremendously. I mean, the one thing Bill and I do share is concern for water quality. We all care about that. We have to fix it. We have to pay for it. We have to have economically viable systems, and I think that's what you were referring to, Mark, uh, in order to do that. Um, the, w the work that we're doing at the Soybean Association is trying to uh, empower producers to be providers of those solutions. It's a uh, <laughs> very... Um, it, uh, you have to be tenacious to work in this. Uh, it's an endurance test. I've been working on this for 30 years, which is a frustration to some stakeholders. Like, when are we going to get there, right? right like, Bill? when are we going to get there, Roger? Yeah. <laughs> so, the scope and scale. I told you about the 10 million acres. There's another 13 million acres that are in corn production. And you just heard from Mark, um, I don't know, there's probably farmers in the room here. Uh, what's the price for corn and soybeans? And, and it's gonna be tough. I'm worried about it. Uh, I, I uh, grew up on a small farm in Eastern Iowa, very, very small. Um, and, and uh, you know, didn't make it in the 80s. We, you know, my, my folks sold the farm, we got it back three times. Believe me, there's farmers out there that lived through the 80s. And, uh, you know, there, there, there's some worry uh, right now. It's, it's real. So we need more diverse options. I agree with that. We need a portfolio of uh, economic drivers that, that keeps farmers performing on the farm. Part of the reason we have so many hogs in this state is because people wanted the manure and that they had the manure to apply to the land, which is a big part of the fertility of growing corn. Um, it does create challenges. A key part of this is, is management. A key part of management is technology and, uh, and research and leveraging science and technology. Um, so maybe I'll stop with that. We'll continue to evolve the conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sustainability, um, the absence of degradation. I have, and I was, I'm paralyzed without a PowerPoint. I have to tell you, I feel like I've lost my glasses. And Me too. have to make it up. 
Uh, but I did bring one visual aid here, and let me let me go back to first of all the three pillars of sustainability. The dimensions are economic, they're social, they're environmental. I think we all understand and start with that premise. The status quo in industrial agriculture in this state is making this state a sacrifice state to industrial agriculture. The metaphor I use is we're beginning to look a lot like West Virginia. West Virginia was a, a coal sacrifice state. We are becoming a sacrifice state to industrial agriculture because it's non-sustainable in its current form. And here are a couple visuals. Let's start with the one with the US map. Uh, we are part of the Mississippi um, Basin, right? Everybody has a good sense of that. Some of you may not have a sense of how big the Mississippi Basin is, and this map does a pretty good job of it. It shows you from Montana to Pennsylvania, big drainage area. But it also shows you with a look at two nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, where the major contributors are to these nutrients that ultimately go down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico and create a hypoxic condition, a condition that essentially ruins marine life. Certainly not sustainable. What this shows you, I believe, and I think Roger and I can agree on this, is that Iowa is a disproportionate contributor to Gulf hypoxia. And the reason for that is industrial agriculture. The public policy of this state involving agriculture really turns around a document called the Nutrient Reduction Strategy. The Nutrient Reduction Strategy um, was compelled on each of the states by the US EPA some time ago. Uh, the EPA said that each state in the Mississippi River Valley needed to come up with a method to reduce nutrient loads into the Gulf of Mexico. Iowa, uh, Secretary Northey, Governor Branstad, people in the Iowa Department of Natural Resources at Iowa State and the Iowa Department of Agricultural and Land Stewardship came up with this extraordinary document uh, called the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy that says that 92% of the nitrogen problem is an example are from non-point source agricultural or quasi-agricultural sources in this state. 92% of what we're exporting down the river in nitrogen is from ag or ag-related, stormwater-related also. Um, and here's the point. The Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy says the way to contribute less to Gulf hypoxia is through a voluntary process of educating farmers, working through groups like the Iowa Soybean Association, the corn growers, cattle producers, pork producers, whatever it may be, to promote conservation practices. Things that will reduce river loadings that ultimately make it to the Gulf. That document has been out for four years now, I believe. I have yet to hear what accomplishments have come out of that document. I will tell you as a water producer in central Iowa, we have had the world's largest nitrate removal facility for 25 years. We continue to run it into the ground and are at a point where to make drinking water safe for central Iowans, we're about to have to invest more in technologies, not only to reduce nitrogen, um, but now a huge concern for us is something called cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins. Blue-green algae is appearing in our water in the Des Moines and Raccoon River, just to your west, even in January and February. So a huge concern for us because we know that that's over nutrification of those waters. The kind of treatment technologies we use to make a water safe in Des Moines or our suburbs or here in Grinnell is something called lime softening. It does a really good job with a lot of things that are in Iowa water like bacteria, suspended soils. You know, you go out to the creek here and grab a pint of water and look at it. It's murky, right? It looks more like cappuccino than it does drinking water. We've got a pretty good system in Grinnell, in Des Moines, in Sioux City, pick wherever you want, that takes care of most of the contaminants in there. But when we get to things like nitrogen in particular, that's a huge concern for us. And now 
a new generation of concern comes out of something called cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins. On the other side of this lastly to be referred to visual aid are the impaired waterways in this state. This state has over 700 streams, rivers that are impaired, meaning that they violate some public health standard. Uh, I don't think there is any principled view of the hydrology of the state that does not point to industrial agriculture as the primary, if not the exclusive source uh, for the impaired waters in the state. Waters generally in this state are impaired because of bacteria, not human bacteria <coughs> largely. Sewage treatment facilities work across this state and they're required to work across this state. It's coming from livestock, from suspended solid soil. Again, Iowa's soils under the current model of industrial agriculture tend to erode and blast into the waterways a whole bunch of soil and nutrients. <coughs> Uh, fertilizer basically coming from industrial agriculture. A huge concern for us in my business on the economic side of our business, I serve 500,000 customers in the city of Des Moines, three quarters of the students who attend public school get subsidized lunches. They are paying, their families are paying to remove pollutants that are put into the waters by ag um, producers upstream from us. That is a shifting of costs from producers to consumers, and it's creating a public health issue. Again, this is not something to be taken lightly. We will have a public water crisis in this state, not because of drought or flooding, things that we are able to manage fairly well, but because of public health issues associated with over-contamination, agrotoxins in our surface drinking water. That ends a portion of the chapter on the dystopia. I'm sure I'll be back for more. <laughs> we continued. So what was interesting is hearing you all <clears throat> talk in many ways about challenges and you sort of very neatly just laid out the three-legged stool that Bill referred to, which is that right now we're not in a system that is economically sustainable. We're lacking some social interactions and community relationships that might facilitate improvements and we're lacking in the environmental components of sustainability. So we sort of just, <laughs> there's, we've got the stool right there and you, you all just sort of brought up different components of it and where there are challenges. So I'm wondering, you each kind of fulfill different roles obviously in this system, which is a very complicated system. If we had all the roles, we'd, there would be more of us than them. So we'll go with what we got here. Uh, I am interested in, from your individual, what, what you can do or what your organization can do um, to improve the sustainability or to enhance, you know, to uh, develop a, a restorative form of agriculture. That's one piece, but the other piece is who else do you need <laughs> to move it forward? And say, who's, who's the other, who, who I, I can do this much, but I need that guy to do the next step. Who, who's missing in your calculation? I'm gonna stick with our round robin here and put poor Mark on the spot first. I won't do that every time, but. Um. Yes, so to induce change from what we've got, as Iowans, um, it would appear that we do not like change. We do not like to change. We will not change <laughs> unless we have enough pain. Um, at this moment in time, we're, we're approaching a, a pain threshold. So, as I look around, I represent the average Iowa farmer, 58 years old, and this is where I'm at. Uh, not profitable. Um, I may retire with nothing. I've not got any social security per se, so the pain is real, and my choice is what am I going to do? So, um, and, and that's twofold. What, what am I going to do? What do I want to do? And what am I going to be forced to do? Probably by a lender. So, my market system is driven by, I, m my business is that I grow things. And, and I can grow this or this or this, but my market says I want corn or beans, largely. That's all I've got. And um, 
I've never actually grown vegetables.